Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to another episode of that show that will not be named. Um, if you notice my glasses going on and off for the duration of the next few videos, it's all basically because these headphones are tight. And they pretty much just press these, uh, press the damn bars of my glasses into my skull. And it hurts. So, to avoid HD, HD bottle opening there, HD drinking. Please invest in a Yeti uh, Blue microphone. These things are freaking incredible. I love it. Um, yeah, so to avoid headaches, sometimes I'll take them off, t toss them aside, but at the, at the same time, it's like, I can't, I can't read shit. Um, today, I wanted to talk about one of my absolute favorite movies. It goes by the name of No Country for Old Men, also one of my favorite books. No Country for Old Men is about this dude named Llewellyn. Yeah, Llewellyn. Llewellyn Moss. And basically, this dude finds a whole bunch of money um, at this place where all these gangsters pretty much shot the shit out of each other. He steals it. There's a tracker in it. Hitman comes after him. Other Hitman tries to finesse him out of the money and, I guess, indirectly try to save his life from first Hitman trying to whoop his ass. Um, and pretty much the whole thing just ends up with Everybody dead except for a uh, uh, sheriff who really played no role and was like one step behind the first uh, assassin the whole time, hitman the whole time, and the first hitman who is utterly scary. So, I'm not sure if I've reviewed this in the past, but it's definitely one of my absolute favorite things, and if I'm making another video on it, it just goes to show how much I love the series. Not the series, the fucking movie. Well, the movie and the book as a joint franchise but anyways uh, getting into it everyone seems to look at Anton Chigurh he's the hitman in it um everyone seems to look at him as like almost like a ghost and during the last scene of the movie they have this thing where um the whole time um Tommy Lee Jones he plays the sheriff who's like always one step behind um Anton Chigurh and when he's going after him, the last scene is like him opening up. He's like, okay, I think he's in here. I think he's in this hotel room. I think he killed Llewellyn or whatever. So he goes in and he undoes the door. But the way that they film it, it's uh, Chigurh getting the money out. And then he looks towards the door and there's feet underneath the door. And somebody's unlocking the door. And pretty much the movie sets it up as if, oh shit, Anton Chigurh is in that room. Tommy Lee Jones is standing outside the room. The sheriff's outside the room. He's going to walk in. They're going to have a showdown. Something's going something's gonna to happen. <clears throat> and then when he opens the door, Anton's not there. But what is there is a vent with um, coins near it. Because Anton, when they were opening, uh, when he was opening like little vents and shit, he would use like a penny or a dime or whatever to open it up as a makeshift screw. And pretty much they set this up as if, like, there were, there were people that I, were, I was watching it with that are like, oh, he went through the vent, he's a ghost. Like, there's no way. And it's like, no, he got the money out of the vent and then he left. Obviously, what was happening in the film was, the, at the ending, the scene with Chigurh and the scene that was shared with um, Tommy Lee Jones, that took place hours apart. It just so happened to be shown, like, on top of one another flashback, forth, back, forth, back, forth, to give you the impression that it's like, Ooh, maybe Anton Chigurh is something, uh, you know, supernatural. And I think that point drives it home further. Because through the whole thing, it's like, no matter what happens to him, he gets hurt. And he, he's, he like, gets shot, he'll get cut, he'll get whatever. And he's just bandaging himself up. The dude's like fucking Jason Voorhees. Like, he just keeps coming back. And then in the end, when, you know, the sheriff goes, fuck it, I'm done. <laughs> and and uh, retires... Um, and all the other characters die via Chigurh. Um, then Chigurh's just left, you know, he goes and kills uh, Llewellyn's wife. Uh, which, uh, there was a whole big thing over whether he killed her or not. He killed her. He, he, he looks at his shoes to make sure there's nothing on them after he leaves the house. He killed her. Come on. It's his code of 
ethics, I guess, his edict. Um, but a lot of people are saying, like, uh, maybe he is supernatural. Maybe it's something odd about him. He's not supernatural. But it, one of the biggest things about this, and I think they purposely try to, like, do... They purposely try to show you that at the end of the film. When, for no particular reason and whatever, after coming back from our house, he gets into a car accident. Somebody slams right into him and breaks his arm. And, the, you know, the bone's sticking out and whatnot. And that's the kind of thing that's just, like, you know... It is what it is. He He's mortal. He can be hurt. He can be wounded. It is possible. And I just think that there was a good little reminder in there at the ending. To, just showing you, like, he's not unstoppable. He can be killed. Just so happens that nobody in this film had the ability to do so. But I found that very interesting about it. That, too, and his, the way that he handles interactions with people. Like, I especially like... And, it's a lot of people's favorite scene when he's talking to the shopkeeper. And the shopkeeper pretty much tries to bring up, like, idle conversation, but these the conversation sounds, like, too nosy or sarcastic to him. So he starts, like, in, indirectly, like, threatening the guy. And when he t tells him about his whole thing with the toying costs, and, you know, the toys, coin's been traveling 32 years or whatever to get to this point. Now that it's here, I'm going to flip it, and you're going to have to say heads or tails. And it basically implied, you know... Pick this one, you die. Pick that one, you live. And then, um... But I especially like his, um... His line where he says... Uh, well, the guy wins it. The guy ends up winning the toss and he's like, Oh, don't throw it in your, um... Pocket, it's your lucky quarter. Uh... Put it anywhere but not in your pocket. Because it, then it'll get mixed in with the other others and become just a coin. Which it is. And I, I was just... Like... What? Like, they just say, it sounds like it should mean something, but then, like, going back and over overanalyzing them, just like, maybe it means nothing? Maybe it means that even though the existence of something that is strange is present, it could be that it's just average? Kind of like um, my theory on miracles. Miracles happen all the time. The only difference is we're only really around to see a number of them, which is why we call them miracles. Like an old woman falling from a plane at like 100 miles, hitting the ground and surviving. Sure, she breaks everyone in the body, but she survives. And is that a miracle? Yes, because it only happened once. Now, if it happens, you know, 100 more times, then we're able to establish, okay, this is a natural occurrence. This is a regular thing that happens. It's, it's possible. It's highly probable. So something like that, that if it's able to be duplicated numerous times, we'll know, okay, it's not a miracle. But because... Something like this happened that was so... It, it's weird because Chigger seems to go on the belief that either, like, A, he has to do what he's doing, or B, he just, like, he does it because that's just, like, the way things are. And I, it doesn't... I don't really get it because whenever, like, perfect example, when the guy wins the toy cost, he looks visually happy. He looks like, when he flips in, he sees the guy, when he's like, well done. And you see there, there's like an air of like, whew, in his voice. And that just absolutely, I found that absolutely stunning. Because, as H.P. Lovecraft said, um, what the hell did he say? The, the, the best explanation, I'm not sure if this was him or somebody trying to be him or somebody. Um, the best explanation is no explanation at all. And I found that interesting. I like doing that w with my own writing. Like, I'll introduce something super evil or something super freaky. And I'll just be like, yeah, so it exists. And that's all you're going to get out of me. But you, you can't do it all the time. Otherwise, it becomes, you know, annoying. But in this particular case, Chigurh, it's like, I'm dying to know more about this guy. Where the hell did he come from? What was his upbringing like? What goes through his mind? What else does he give a shit about? Does he give a shit about anything? He's just such an interesting character. And because of that lack of backstory or that lack of motive, that makes him all the more interesting. Unlike, you know, Llewellyn or um, Tommy Lee Jones' character, they, like, we know what they're about. We know what they, from the get-go, we know Tommy Lee Jones is like, his biggest fear is like dying on the job. Meeting something in the new age that is just too horrible for someone of his old-timey nature. And that that's like, that definitely made him understandable in the end when he decided to, you know what, I'm not going to pursue this anymore, I'm going to retire, 
I'm going to wash my hands of the new age and that's going to be it. And I'm just going to pass on, you know, feeling how I feel. And that, in the ending, I couldn't real. a lot of people were saying, a lot of people that I were talking to about No Country for Old Men said that, you know, like, oh, pff, he's a pussy, he didn't, he didn't follow it through. But if you were kind of listening to him from the beginning, that's, it was kind of building up to that. The whole purpose of Hibbs' uh, existence was that he represented the old days and that he's not ready for the new age. He's not able to combat it. Therefore, he is inefficient in fighting something like Chigurh. Um, then you have Llewellyn, which, honestly, Llewellyn, I just think of him as an unfortunate piece to this puzzle. I think he came into it completely inexperienced, completely, well, not inexperienced, he was able to combat him, sure, but I think, I, I find it funny how the hitman, uh, played by Woody Harrelson, the other hitman, who was, he's someone who's advanced in the world of, you know, I guess killing people and shady shit. And he died via Chigurh. And meanwhile, this welder, this retired welder who has no killing people experience in his life, combats this hitman better than the other, better than the actual hitman does. I really thought that was interesting. Um, because now you have this guy who has no, well, sure, he had like army training, but here's somebody who like, his whole life was, you know, working a Joe job. And then here you have somebody who was, like, literally killing people for a living. That, that was after Nam, because they both went to Nam, as the movie states. And the book, too. I forget if they mentioned it in the book. They probably did. I had a shit memory. But... Just a very, very interesting book. Everything about it was so cool. Definitely goes down as one of my absolute favorite movies. You... Bet your ass the second it hit DVD, I scooped that shit up. I was not gonna... It's not gonna let that float out there unwatched and unwanted. So, No Country for Old Men. Whether I already did a video on this or not, not sure. Like I said, just make goes to a testament of how much I love this damn movie and that damn book. So, also Cormac McCarthy's writing style with his unique way of writing. Which, if you want to see what I mean, check out his book, read his book, and you'll see... What I'm talking about. All right. Ooh, water belch. I'll see you guys next time. And uh, thank you for joining me. Adios.